Hello and welcome to the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on September 26, 2022 from South Carolina Public Radio Studios here in Columbia. Just so you know, some of the information in this podcast may have changed by the time you've heard it. This episode features a preview of what's before House lawmakers on Tuesday as they decide what to do with the Senate's version of the abortion bill. We hear from Winthrop University professor Scott Huffman on the latest findings of his Southern Focus survey, including thoughts on abortion exceptions. In Business SCDOT Secretary Christy Hall provides an update on Interstate 26 widenings and other transportation infrastructure projects going on across the state. We also break down gas tax funding for you, something I know you're all interested in, and we take a look at new unemployment data, as well as the Fed's recent decision to increase interest rates. And in medical, we have an update on monkeypox in the state and what COVID has in store for us during the cold weather months ahead. And of course, we want to hear your stories. That's why we have a voicemail box set up to hear from y'all about your life during these interesting times that we live in. Now, the one way you can do that is by calling us at 803-563-7169. You can leave us your name, where you're calling from, and what's going on in your world. You can even text us, but we'd prefer to hear your lovely voice. You have to hear mine. Now let's hear yours. (laughs) 803-563-7169. It's fall, (laughs) y'all. Now for the latest in South Carolina. Currently, the spread of COVID-19 is medium, according to county-level data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For the week ending September 17th, there have been 6,343 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and four deaths. Both of those metrics have decreased from the week prior, according to DHEC. On average, there were 382 South Carolinians hospitalized with COVID-19, 52 were in intensive care, and 17 were on ventilators. Currently, 53% of eligible South Carolinians are fully vaccinated. On Tuesday, all eyes will be on the South Carolina House of Representatives as they meet to vote on whether to agree with the changes the Senate made to their abortion bill and send it on to the governor for his signature, or insist on their version of the bill and set up for a conference committee to hash out the details, which might not come to fruition. Now, the potential problem with that latter scenario is that the Senate doesn't assign any members to a conference committee, because the bill the Senate passed is essentially as good as it's going to get. So a conference committee wouldn't change that, and the bill dies. However, this is becoming the most likely scenario unless certain minds are changed in the House, specifically Greenwood Republican John McCravey's. The Senate amended bill includes exceptions for abortions up to six weeks, like current law, and exceptions for rape and incest up to 12 weeks, with reporting to the county sheriff along with the preservation of fetal DNA. It also allows for exceptions at any time during the pregnancy for the life and health of the mother and for fatal fetal anomaly, with the approval of two doctors. The House bill gave exceptions only for rape and incest up to 12 weeks, with reporting, and exceptions for the life and health of the mother. So again, House Option 1. Approve the Senate bill with exceptions that even strong anti-abortion advocates in the Senate accepted as a compromise, a bill that offers more restrictive language than what is currently on the books. Or House Option 2 insist on their version that was even difficult to pass among House Republicans and promptly changed by the Senate, and then watch it likely die as a result. This would also give Democrats a win as well as ammunition to attack Republicans, and it could push the issue into the legislative session. Or not, since the leadership will be annoyed at this process, especially after countless hours spent on hearings, testimony, and debate on this topic in the offseason, a time that was specifically created to rapidly address abortion separately from bogging down session. So if we see this bill die at the hands of a few House Republicans, it's my understanding that the House leadership won't mince their words when it comes to who is to blame and will create a frosty lens to view everything through during the upcoming legislative session, like committee assignments, what bills get hearings, any new rules that might come out, caucus resources, and possibly budget funding decisions, just to name a few possibilities. We'll be watching how House Speaker Merle Smith and Majority Leader Davey Hyatt handle this Tuesday and going forward possibly. Now, I asked Governor Henry McMaster what his message was to the House, and specifically if he wanted them to concur with the Senate. Here was his response on September 22nd. And just a note, this interview was conducted after an SCDOT press conference on Interstate 26. So we'll have more on that in business, but that's why it sounds like we're standing next to I-26. Well, my message has been the same to the House and the Senate. 
and that is we, we need to craft legislation, whatever, whatever they uh, decide on, has to be something that is reasonable and something that will be acceptable to the great consensus of the people in the state. And I think the, the, heart, the heartbeat bill had four exceptions. I think that has been accepted by the consensus. Of course, that's, that's in court. There are a number of exceptions that are mentioned in, in this. Uh, I think the people, the, the, the most citizens uh, do not want to see uh, an abortion occur where the, the, the baby feels pain. We have a law on that already that is, has passed. Uh, they, some see abortion, they don't want to see it as another means of birth control. And what, what that means, I think that this consensus is that there will need to be exceptions. And both houses now have included some, and we've already passed some into law which I signed with the heartbeat bill. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that they are going to work hard and, and present a, a bill that is acceptable to most, the vast majority of the people in the state. After all this time, all this energy, we've been over these subjects for years. I think they're going to do the right thing and have something that's not radical. It probably won't please everyone because nothing that the legislature does and the law ever does, but this will be, I think we'll have a, a bill at the end that'll be presented that'll be acceptable and reasonable to the vast majority of the people in the state. So you want to see the House concur with what the Senate did? Senate no, I, I'm not, not giving that advice to them. My advice is to, to take your time, be careful, and consider the, the wishes, the hopes, and dreams of the vast majority of the people in the state. And there is support among Republicans for exceptions according to an array of polling out there right now including the Southern Focus Survey of 11 Southern states conducted by Winthrop University political science professor, Dr. Scott Huffman. And he also oversees the Winthrop Poll. I spoke with Huffman on This Week in South Carolina. We talked about all of the survey's findings, but specifically in this portion about abortion and whether no exception abortion is a winning issue in the current environment. Here's Scott Huffman. The, the number of people who are in favor of legal abortion in the case of the health of the mother, especially the life of the mother. Um, those are overwhelming numbers among you know anybody, Democrat, Republican, anybody else. And the same is true with other exceptions when you know when you're looking at in the case of rape, for example. So it's not necessarily true that, hey, we're in the Bible belt, people are automatically going to be against abortion. They might not, nobody's in favor of abortion but they do believe in legal abortion under at least some circumstances. Well, you have to remember uh, the South Carolina legislature is heavily gerrymandered. And when you run for reelection, there's a lot of seats, sometimes a majority of seats where there's no competition in the general election. So when you are running, you're frankly running for the primary. And who shows up in the primary but the strongest part, the most conservative or the most liberal folks in the district. So when you are playing to your uh, electorate, the truth is a lot of times you're playing to your primary electorate. And for the Republicans in the legislature now, many of them are talking not to the general population because they're frankly not as worried about the general election. They are keeping their seat safe by keeping challengers away in the primaries. Now, as far as South Carolina, right now, we're a Republican plus 10 state. Abortion being sort of the national and state issue it is, is likely to drive up participation among moderate women voters, and that could definitely eat into the lead that Republicans have, and that could be a factor in things like the gubernatorial race and some of the uh, House races. I spoke with Scott about other issues during our wide-ranging interview on This Week in South Carolina, including about the Republican Party and what it means to be a MAGA or Make America Great Again Republican, an America First Republican, or a traditional Republican, especially when it comes down to who believes the results of the 2020 presidential election. Here's part of that conversation. Sure. Um, you know, so what we did was we asked if somebody said they were a Republican, we asked them to rate themselves on three scales. So they could identify as strong or weak MAGA Republican, make America great again, strong or weak America first Republican, strong or weak traditional Republican. Um, the America first, we just sort of 
started thinking about that because the now soon to be ex Congressman Madison Cawthorn, that one of my colleagues, that's his congressman, um, stopped referring himself to, to himself as a Trump Republican and started referring him to himself as an America First Republican. So we wanted to see if that was some type of rebranding, and it really isn't. It basically, the first thing to realize is there's just a ton of overlap between MAGA Republicans and certainly America First Republicans. But there is a strong amount of overlap between Trump or MAGA Republicans and traditional Republicans. And so we did this before Joe Biden's speech where he talked about a, a, a subgroup within Republicans, the MAGA Republicans who are a danger. Well, the truth is there is no bright line between Trump, MAGA Republicans, and traditional Republicans. There's a lot of overlap. Certainly there are people who identify as traditional Republicans who are not MAGA Republicans, but the overwhelming majority identify as both. It is not some bright line dividing subsect of the party. Um, however, if you compare people who are strong Trump Republicans, strong MAGA Republicans with people who don't identify as strong MAGA Republicans, then you begin to see differences within the Republican Party. There is much more to this conversation, which you can find in full, along with all of our Twisk episodes and lead episodes on youtube.com slash South Carolina ETV. It's a really informative and objective interview that I highly encourage you to check out. Maybe we'll drop the full interview in a lead special podcast if AT lets me, or I'll just parse out some of it throughout the week. He doesn't let me do that. All right, you know what we're going to talk about. Say it with me now. Interest rates. Hmm. Yes, you know what happened. You know. <laughs> you know what you did. The Federal Reserve last week bumped up the federal funds rate by 0.75%. Now we're at a target range of 3 to 3.25% in the Fed's latest attempt to clamp down on stubbornly high inflation rates. The benchmark rate is now the highest since 2008. Now here is Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. The U.S. economy has slowed from the historically high growth rates of 2021, which reflected the reopening of the economy following the pandemic recession. Recent indicators point to modest growth of spending and production. Growth in consumer spending has slowed from last year's rapid pace, in part reflecting lower real disposable income and tighter financial conditions. Activity in the housing sector, sector has weakened significantly, in large part reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment, while weaker economic growth abroad is restraining exports. As shown in our summary of economic projections, since June, FOMC participants have marked down their projections for economic activity, with the median projection for real GDP growth standing at just 0.2 percent this year and 1.2 percent next year, well below the median estimate of the longer run normal growth rate. Despite the slowdown in growth, the labor market has remained extremely tight, with the unemployment rate near a 50-year low, job vacancies near historical highs, and wage growth elevated. Powell said the labor market is still out of balance, with demand for workers exceeding the supply of available workers. Unemployment is expected to tick up over the coming year, according to Powell, as the country faces slower growth and higher rates. However, without stabilizing prices now, there would be far greater pain later on, he said. You know, we're never going to say that there, that there are too many people working, but the, the real point is this. Um, inflation, what we hear from people when we meet with them is that, that they really are suffering from inflation. And if we want to set ourselves up, really, really light the way to another period of a very strong labor market, we have got to get inflation behind us. I wish there were a, a painless way to do that. There isn't. So what we need to do is get rates up to, to the point where we're play, putting meaningful downward pressure on inflation, and that's what we're, that's what we're doing. And um, we, we don't, certainly don't, don't hope, we, we, we certainly haven't given up the idea that we can have a relatively modest increase in, in unemployment. Nonetheless, we need to complete this task. 
The labor situation remains strong in South Carolina, with unemployment declining in August, according to the Department of Employment and Workforce. The statewide rate ticked down to 3.1 percent from 3.2 percent. Now, for August, we saw the number of unemployed individuals drop by 1,000, and those employed drop by 4,000. The State Department of Employment and Workforce Executive Director Dan Elzey said, "Quote: While the numbers tend to fluctuate from month to month, South Carolina continues to enjoy record employment this year." Some employers have had temporary layoffs due to parts and supply shortages, and there are business closures. What makes this time unique is the number of alternatives and opportunities for job seekers. There are more than 100,000 jobs available across the state, as well as training and development to help people gain skills for a new job. Quote. Now, if you're looking for a recession-proof job, might I suggest getting into road construction? That's something that is not going away anytime soon in our state. With the state working through a backlog of paving and expansion projects to keep up with the growing needs of our residents and commerce in the state, one such project is the widening of 16 miles of Interstate 26 from Little Mountain to Irmo. The project addresses traffic congestion between Columbia and Newberry by going from four to six lanes between Little Mountain and Peak exits, and then from four to eight lanes between Peak and Irmo exits. That leads right on into Malfunction Junction, which is also in the process of a complete overhaul. Now, going back to this other project, there will be seven new overpasses and three new interchanges on top of that expansion road work. This will come at a cost of $512 million, funded through a variety of state and federal dollars. The project is currently 60% complete, with an anticipated completion date of December 2024. To mark this, SCDOT Secretary Christy Hall held a press conference with Governor Henry McMaster about it last week. Here's Secretary Hall. Again, we're on the side of a highway. Yeah. So our investment on the I-26 corridor is being、uh, utilizing our part of our dollars allocated as part of our 10-year program. And of course, you may have heard us mention that we、uh, received 190 million dollars of additional federal funds recently. Some of those dollars will come to help supplement this project as needed, and then, of course, on the rest of the I-26 corridor, we'll be using our traditional funding plus the, the dollars that the governor referenced through、uh, the ARPA program, as well as some of the、uh, additional general fund dollars that were allocated to the DOT. So it's really、um, a, a mixture of, of funding coming together to, to hit that strategic objective to widen I-26 from the Newberry area all the way down into Charleston. So this portion is part of expanding 114 miles of I-26 from Newberry to Charleston, and part of the more than two billion dollars being poured into the corridor, which of course includes Malfunction Junction, which is nearly a year into the design and acquisition phase of the whole project. We're going to see more and more of that construction ramp up over the next several years. But Hall mentioned that the enormous road projects in the state, including future expansions of I-26 between Columbia and Charleston. Have served as an incentive in attracting new construction companies and jobs to the state. We expect SCDOT to announce the first contract for the expansion between Columbia and Charleston in the coming days. And of course, she says every other year there will be about 10 to 11 miles worth of widening to Columbia and Charleston, working from both ends. And the I-95 interchange at 26 will be updated before those two ends meet. The entire widening project is expected to be wrapped up around 2034. Thanks to additional state and federal funds that have been sent to SCDOT to expedite the entire project. So we always talk about the gas tax, and we know that the 12 cent gas tax increase was fully implemented in July, and now totals 28.7 cents per gallon of gas. But how does that break down? Have you ever wondered? Do you want to know? Well, you're going to find out, because 10 cents of it, or 374 million dollars a year, goes toward paving, rural road safety, interstates, and bridges. Nine cents, or three hundred thirty-three million dollars, goes for what's called field maintenance, which includes highway workers' salaries and benefits, and mowing, contracts, asphalt, etc. Six cents, or one hundred sixty-seven million dollars, goes to other entities, including your county transportation committee, which you can petition to get your road paved in your county, and also the state infrastructure bank. And three cents goes to federal matching. Now, the gas tax is just one of four major state revenue streams for SCDOT. Along with new car sales fees, general fund appropriations, and registration and licensing fees, whereas federal funds make up the remaining 42 percent of the budget,、I'm、talking about a billion dollars for the current year. Federal funding is passed every five or so years, and the current funding bill was the bipartisan infrastructure law passed last year. These funds are reimbursed and require state match and have a lot of strings. But as you know, SCDOT was ready with additional matching funds. 
passed by the legislature to capitalize on additional federal dollars for projects that are ready to go in the state. Here's Secretary Hall. So our original 10-year plan had more than 140 miles of interstate work uh, envisioned. Of course, we've expanded that with the uh, addition of I-26 between Columbia and Charleston into, uh, uh, into that accelerated time frame. We currently have about 80 miles of interstate under construction today, uh, well north of $2 billion worth of work, including uh, phases one and two of Carolina Crossroads down the road here in Columbia. 85 corridor really from Spartanburg all the way to the North Carolina state line. Work's going on on I-20 at the Georgia border, uh, as well as right here in Columbia. And then of course, um, we've got the work right outside of Charleston. We just completed on I-26, uh, and then several interchanges that are uh, being worked on on I-77. So pretty much every interstate in this entire state is uh, under construction or receiving some sort of upgrade. And that's, that's very, um, uh, that speaks really clearly to the commitment of the policymakers to make sure that our infrastructure is set to, to take us to that next level. A lot happening on interstates across the state and as someone who traverses I-26 often, I can't wait for those additional lanes. Keep paving. Gavin says keep paving. Let's start with medical with a monkeypox or mpox update. There have been 156 confirmed cases in South Carolina according to DHEC. That's as of September 23rd. As of that date as well, 1,899 vaccinations have been given. Cases were ticking down over the past two weeks, but saw a jump of 14 cases for the week ending September 23rd. And DHEC also began providing demographic information for cases and vaccinations. So let's take a look at this data. data. The data shows that for the first 1,513 first doses of the vaccine, 44% went to white non-Hispanics and 22% to black non-Hispanics. However, the case data shows the opposite, with 52% of black people having confirmed cases and 23% of white people. Those aged 21 through 40 make up the bulk of the cases in the state, with those 31 to 35 representing the highest number with 30 cases. Now, those in that age range also make up the most vaccinated as well. There are thousands of doses available statewide to any man who has sex with men, also known as MSM, including gay or bisexual men, transgender or gender nonconforming individuals, along with any person receiving HIV PrEP treatment. You can call the DHEC care line at 1-855-472-3432 to schedule an appointment or go online to scdhec.gov mpx. All right, we're going from monkeypox to COVID right now. And I'm going to just tell you right now, you're going to hear me use the word sublineage a lot in this section. I'm not going to apologize. Anyway, what strain is going to be the dominant COVID strain as we head into the cold weather months? That's what scientists and researchers are wondering right now. Currently, the BA.5 sublineage of Omicron is the dominant strain, accounting for some 85% of cases in the United States but others could soon start advancing, according to the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. More specifically, the sublineages of the Omicron subvariants, BA.2, BA.4, and BA.5, begin to show growth advantages compared to their parents. Hmm. In the United States, prevalence of BA.4 and BA.5 appears to be decreasing, while Omicron sublineage cases have been rising. BA.4.6, for example, is now estimated to make up 10% of new cases. BF.7, a BI.5 sublineage, is now estimated to make up 1.7% of new cases. BF.7 has garnered particular concern among the scientific community as it has recently made up more than 10% and even over 25% of cases in some Western European nations. However, some experts have argued that BQ.1, a BA.5 sublineage, and a sublineage of BA.2.75 demonstrates additional immune evasion. That's also a threat. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about these sublineages. They mutate, they're a little bit more evasive, makes it tricky when it comes to vaccines. 
Now, of course, it's still too early to tell which sublineage might become predominant and where. The continuously evolving virus promises to keep the attention of scientists and public health practitioners even as much of the world wants to move on. Despite all this sublineage talk, medical professionals continue to encourage folks to get the newest booster out there from either Moderna or Pfizer. Welcome to the wind down section, our little break from the news. We talk about life during the pandemic and we want to hear your stories as well. It's fall, y'all. We talked about that earlier. Come gather with us by calling 803-563-7169. You have to leave us your name and your number. Well, maybe just your name. Leave us your name, where you're calling from. And your take on fall. Give and us your, all your fall hot takes. Yeah, and your stories. Don't your remember. stories. How are we going to know your stories if you don't call in, Bo? I just want to let them. I want to let everyone know that I'm drinking my coffee with my pumpkin spice creamer in it. Yeah, it was I was disgusting. attacked by fall. Fall has attacked me, folks. Gavin has. He walked in this morning with his fresh, <laughs> fresh pumpkin milk, and uh, it's <laughs> disgusting. Look, Juggo pumpkin milk. I dared him it's to drink 100% it It's 100 natural. <laughs> <laughs> it from, says so on the side of it. Fresh squeeze from the nicest pumpkins around, right? Is this sustainable? Yeah, it's very sustainable. Yeah, oh, yeah. It sounds great. Anyway, Gavin, oh, it's so good to be back. Yo, AG, huh? welcome back from Honeymoon Week. Oh, it's so I good know, to be back. I know everyone's glad to hear you're here. Oh, I'm still here, on, here. I'm still on West Coast time. I, it's been brutal. You know, I'm, I'm you real. You forgot lunch today. This is. I forgot to go eat lunch. Uh, this is West Coast AT, okay? <laughs> uh, oh, my God. I'm so jealous. Um, oh, God. I'm, I'm all. I mean. Oh, out of sorts. Okay. Anyway, Gavin, we got a call. We got such a good call. Okay? You ready? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cowabunga, dude. Hey. Hang, hang 10. Hang loose, bro. Mahalo. Hey, dude. <laughs> get pitted, dude. <laughs> you come back from the West Coast and you're giving me a hard time for pumpkin milk. <laughs> pumpkin milk. Oh, dude. it was a real thing, disgusting. you'd be ahead of the curve. Okay. So, you ready? Answer. Fall away. Answer, you coward. <laughs> Fall away. Fall away. Mahalo. Mahalo. Okay, here we go. This is Danielle from Lexington, wife to correspondent Kevin, um, who is passively aggressively telling me that I needed to call every time the lead is brought up in our household, which is frequently enough because he likes when he gets played on the radio. But uh, just checking in while I've enjoyed all this spicy talk about hot dogs, um, almost as passionate as Sen and Sheila are talking about abortion rights. I'd like to move on to fair food. It is coming up uh, this week. I was able to knock off something off of my list and entered into the fair photograph. So that was pretty cool. But the state fair food is coming, and I feel like the anticipation is here. What are the thoughts on that? Um, hope you guys don't get divorced over it. Thanks. Wife Danielle of correspondent Kevin. <laughs> Thank you for calling in. I love passive aggressive <laughs> uh, marital spats, especially when the lead's in the middle of it. But we don't want to be. In, I don't. I don't want to be in the middle of this. I know you're saying. I hope we all don't get divorced. I hope no one gets divorced as because of the lead. That'd just be too much for me to handle. Yeah, it's too much power a- any one man could have. Yeah, I mean, ever since my parents divorced and <laughs> my dad getting the podcast and then giving it to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I've been through it, okay? I don't need to go through it again. Absolute ringer, yeah. <laughs> but uh, state fair food discussion, AT. I'll, yes. I'll take fair food for 200, please. Mm-hmm. I love this topic, Danielle. I love you calling in and giving us a great topic to talk about. Okay? To munch on. To munch on, sure. Why not? <laughs> okay, so the fair has a great lunch deal, right? Yes. You give them five bucks, you go and you can eat lunch, and if you get out in time, you get your five bucks back. And we are... At Ground Zero here. Yes. We, it is directly across the street. We, we I go there enough times that I, I eat fair food maybe two or three times. Anyway, so as far as favorite things go, I will say my favorite is, and, and Gavin and I will disagree on this mm-hmm. here, uh, my favorite is the Fisk Fries. Boo. Gavin Boo. is nonplussed <laughs> by them, and I cannot understand Just like how. the lamest fry. I think I, it's pretty good. I, I can never eat enough of them, See, but and it's not enjoyable to me because they're so problem, tiny. Your problem is you're using your hands there. You, I don't you, use you, my hands. You use chopsticks. I use chopsticks. Talk about, I use chopsticks. I, you're not making it any more appealing. <laughs> I could use 
I could use a, a ladle and still not be satisfied. I don't know. You get it. You can buy them by the bucket. It's a small bucket. It's just not. It's, I want boardwalk fries if I'm having a bucket. Yeah, or they're not as good as boardwalk fries. I will give you that. I will agree to that. But much like boardwalk fries, they are absolute vehicles for vinegar. <laughs> yes, I'll you know? give that vehicle. Uh, yeah, vinegar and salt. I'll yes. take. Yes, please. And I like that. You know. Sure. As far as the rest of it goes. I remember last year you ate what? Some it was monstrosity. like two years ago. It was two years ago. It was ago. a monstrosity was though, right? Oh, yeah, it was the, the donut burger, which you know everyone's talking about all the time. I'm like, yes, I'll throw my hat in the ring on this one. I want to see what it's all about. However, uh, <laughs> however, however, uh, I hate to disagree here. Um, I, I, I would rather do it myself because the, the donut was. It was very flat. The donut Everything was basic. Was it wasn't a good crispy cream yeah. donut. It was a glaze, but it was still. It seemed kind of old. The burger itself was Bad. probably the saddest burger. It was I've ever very not good looking. And I just thought, if I'm doing a donut burger where my buns are just glazed donuts, I, I need something better. And that was it. A, needed to be decadent, down. you yeah. know. And as someone who does hate Franken food, yeah. as is canon on this podcast, uh, like. It just like it just didn't look like a good donut burger, no. and, and like you want it to be yeah. drippy with goo, gross, a mess, and it just yeah. wasn't. And it wasn't. Um, We're going to be out at the fair. Yes, we are. Gavin and I are giving a talk, a TED talk of <laughs> sorts, <laughs> at the fair. So if you want to come see ETV people, we will be there. We'll let you know the day. What's the date? I'm not quite sure on the day. <laughs> But, Sorry I brought it up, guys, but uh, yeah, we'll be out there. I think the 18th or the 19th. I have no idea, but I will. So just I, loosely I mean, pen that down. If guys. anyone gives me a, a, a we'll slot eat. that I need to speak yes. in, I, I will fill that. I will say, if you bring us any of this food, we'll eat it. I'll eat you it on the spot. You can say that you made us eat food in front of you. Yeah, I mean. I, I wouldn't I, want to, that, <laughs> to be able to brag about that. I, I love to encourage that. Just bring us disgusting, <laughs> disgusting food. Uh, I would hate if you brought me all these french fries. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see me just like grimacing while eating. You them. should see the faces of the people when I whip out chopsticks to eat those. You would think it's great. They're like, I give you a fork, and I'm like, it doesn't reach. Yeah, and I mean, it's worth it just to go because it's usually me, you, Ru- the, the Russ McKinney. Oh yeah, he and loves fish Tut fries. Underwood. Mm-hmm. So if you can imagine, it's quite the crew to see rolling if up. One man who knows everything about the fair and the fair's food is Tut Underwood. Tut Underwood. He knows everything. As far, but Danielle, back. We've digressed so much. <laughs> yeah. Back to the other food. Maybe I'll eat a turkey leg this year. I Come like gather tur- around, watch watch him eat a turkey leg. I love a turkey leg, but you can measure inflation on the price of those turkey legs. Well, that's what we'll have to start doing. Yeah, I bet it's going to be. Can't believe. I guess maybe twenty bucks. This okay, year. well I'm looking up what they did. They had the dedicated spring fair food drive through. Hardcore, we never go to that, but it's looking at the prices from the springtime. Yeah, fifteen dollars for a turkey leg. Fifteen bucks. Not Interested bad. to see what it's gonna be like. Probably be twenty a, bucks. Twenty dollars. Fifty. Fifty. I don't know. <laughs> There's a sausage sandwich that doesn't yeah. sound too crazy. No, um, the pe- I've seen people. Do not eat the pizza in the fair, people. What are you doing? <laughs> this is a plea. Don't eat the pizza. If I got one plea. I'm begging you, do not eat the pizza at the fair. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the lemonade at the fair. It's so oh, sugary. the lemonade is amazing. <laughs> like, the lemonade is good. Like, you know, get rid of your teeth. Spike, you know, spike that blood sugar. Mm-hmm. Just really zone out with yeah. that. And then come down with some... some Ultra salty fries. Yeah, just get that good balance for your body. I can, I can let you. I'll, I'll, <laughs> your I'll body's abide. gonna thank you. I'll abide Guaranteed. by uh, a corn dog too. I'll sure. eat a corn dog. You know me. I don't care for a corn dog. I'm not a huge corn dog person either. But I like, think I've had one in my life. If you handed me a corn dog, I would eat it. Yeah, that goes for pretty much most food when it comes to me. You, you yeah, know that for you're being much more discerning anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, if we did a terrible job of answering that, Danielle, I apologize. But <laughs> I, I loved you calling in. Please keep calling in and. Shame your husband a little bit more every mm-hmm. single time. I love that. Uh, uh, I'm glad to be back. 15. Eagles won twice. Yeah, beat my commanders. While I was gone. Uh, your commanders. Commander Carson sacked nine times. Goodbye. Uh, anyway, have a good week, folks. I missed you all when I was on vacation. And uh, please call in. He's we need back, the calls. Guys. We need He's the back. calls. Yeah, we let us know. Talk to us about the fair, fair food, any fall hot takes. We are here for you. 803 563 7169. Do us like Danielle did and give us a shout. We'd love hearing from you guys. You can also leave us an iTunes review. We love those too. And you can stay up to date with the latest news on scetv.org and South Carolina Public Radio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. Hello, I can't hear myself very well. Hello, hello, I think hello. that's the wrong microphone.
Mike four. Hello. That's it. <laughs> AT, AT, AT.